So I introduced my research. I am a research officer. So we started this uh, project uh, after Russian full-scale invasion to Ukraine. The main idea of this research is to understand the Russian communication strategy to internal audience and uh, identify strengths and weaknesses and also possible indicators for invasion. So this project consists of three different parts. So basically first part is uh, uh, general un uh, understanding of the Russian st strategic communication. Second part, uh, it is uh, media analysis for half year. And uh, final is uh, physical environment. So this study is not finished yet fully, but will be published in March. So today we have the Victor's dog shows from Debunk Org, and also we have uh, uh, Dr. Neville Bolt and uh, Dr. Uh, Vera Mission Shapir from the King's College. So, Victor, to share your findings on your part. Thank you, Rimundas, uh, for the introduction. And a nice opportunity so we can again meet face to face. Uh, I'll try to click. Next, uh, so uh, Debunk uh, a bit expanded over last years, so we migrated to debunk.org. Uh, we are no longer operating only in European Union. Uh, we're also outside. Uh, we're working a lot in the Baltics, in the Poland, in the Balkans, also in United States. Uh, so that's why now it's debunk.org. Uh, so now we cover eight countries. Uh, we so far did more than 100 reports um, covering all these different kind of analysis. Uh, and this is one of the biggest studies uh, done on Kremlin TV and Kremlin communications at the same time in, in the pre-war and the wartime. Uh, it covers a lot. Uh, this slide is just a reminder uh, that Kremlin has built its media as a weapon. Even the Kremlin representatives themselves say, uh, Vladimir Putin said that there should be a patriotically minded people ahead of the state information sources in 2013. Sergei Shoigu 2015 said that information has become another type of weaponry, another branch of the armed forces. And in 2018, uh, Margarita Simonyan said that RT is capable of conducting information war against the West. Uh, also, Kremlin established a really tight control, legal control, in Russia, uh, which means that there's no single independent media left within Russia. All the ones were expelled, marked as foreign agents, and everyone who is still operating there is tightly controlled, so there is no free press coverage. And this is very important to understand, specifically when we are having discussions in EU, should some of these channels will be banned and so on. So this is a weapon. This is not media. So we can even, it's even hard to call it media by definition, because it's not. Uh, Kremlin was able over the last 20 years uh, create an industrial scale of disinformation and propaganda. And with that also comes the money. They are spending in 2021, they have spent 1.5 billion USD dollars on the, just these few channels. And this is only the official spending from Kremlin federal budget, which, ac which accounts 0.5% from all of their federal budget. What's even more interesting and also shows that this is an actual weapon, because during the invasion in the first quarter of the 2022, they spent three times more money compared to the year before. And propaganda is a tool, as well as this information, to hide all the bad things that they have mismanaged. Every time they fail, the propaganda and disinformation are tools to adjust what people are thinking inside of Russia, how people are perceiving Russia outside of Russia. And a very good reminder is that this second most powerful military army in the world, on paper and on propaganda, last year has failed miserably. And we can see that everything they were talking about uh, was just a propaganda bubble 
and uh, actual strength is way smaller. They did a lot of mistakes. There is still a lot of old-fashioned think thinking, very linear planning, uh, hard time to adjust to an actual situation when they hit the real problems. But still, it's industrial scale and uh, this, that much of spending of official budget. And just a quick reminder that they are spending even more on their secret services and running the operations with, uh, with the think tanks, other websites, and so on. Those budgets are uh, not public. They never will be. So the spending is even higher. Uh, within this analysis, uh, it's a very large scale. It's six institutions in Kremlin being analyzed, monitored on every second basis uh, during this six-month period to map out five months before the invasion and one month into the invasion. Also monitoring top TV shows uh, within Kremlin media, uh, which accounted around 300 TV shows, uh, more than 360 hours of watch time, 1,400 content pieces published on Kremlin official uh, websites as well. Uh, so from the amount of the content, you can see that our analysts needed some rehabilitation after analyzing all of what was in there. Uh, so what's interesting, uh, so we can see that uh, uh, Kremlin MFA, the red, was the prime communicator before the invasion and into the invasion and we can see that invasion starts here on the eighth week uh, of the 2022 and you can see that uh, it's a huge peak uh, but what's actually interesting that there is a very clear evidence of collapse of communications and collapse of the plan in the 10 days of the invasion you can see that on the week 10 there's a half 50 percent drop in mfa communications because of they plan to achieve everything in around 10 days and it failed and they needed to rewrite their strategy and it shows that uh, they still have the problems uh, they are not that flexible to adapt the situation they are pretty linear they are going with this big propaganda machine and when something really uh, changes and they hit with a reality that is different that they have planned they still struggle to uh, to adapt in the black we have kremlin mod and here's a very interesting thing happening. Uh, Kremlin MOD takes over the prime communication leadership from MFA and starts a disinformation campaign uh, with a biolabs. So is this an often thing? Uh, yes. Biolabs uh, as a disinformation tool, a technique by Kremlin is used at least since from 1949. And they used this biolabs disinformation uh, smokescreen in multiple wars and it's always the same so they will say that there is uh, some biolabs there are some birds bugs uh, or or any other uh, biologic species that will fly into russia and kill russians or kill russian soldiers or they will be birds uh, with the microchips in their heads and they will attack only russian planes and they will uh, fly over the NATO planes or Ukrainian planes. So this is always the same. Uh, and uh, uh, this was a really big campaign. Uh, all March, uh, this was the prime topic and their smoke screen. And, and this is uh, a technique uh, to distract and to take out the audience uh, uh, attention to a different topic. So they wanted to hide the problems, what's happening. That's why they started this and they ran it at a really large scale. Uh, jumping forward, with this analysis, we developed uh, uh, new uh, pretty state-of-art methodologies and technologies how to analyze uh, Kremlin's or any authoritarian regime communications. Uh, this slide shows the prime topic uh, for Ukraine as a topic being uh, communicated in the, in the Kremlin TV and governmental communications. What does it mean prime? It means that if it's uh, on TV show, it's mentioned in the first minutes. If it's on the articles, it's the prime topic about Ukraine. It's not just Ukraine keyword mentioned somewhere there. It's measured the intensity, how much about it, uh, how bad about it, and so on. And we can see that before the invasion, uh, Kremlin TV coverage on these two TV channels and two TV stations we're having between 58 and 80% of the TV shows where Ukraine is the prime topic. So they were preparing for this for a long time. 
and one of these TV shows was established uh, even straight after Crimea occupation. So it's a project to discredit Ukraine. On the Kremlin official communications on the six uh, ministries, we can see that between 11 and 36 percent of all of their published materials are primarily about Ukraine. Then you can see the new year, uh, nothing happening in any either TV or government communications. And then uh, next to the invasion, we see that uh, there's a huge uh, jump uh, for the Ukraine as becoming that's absolute number one prime topic in all of their communications. The TV shows are going with a 100% government communications are going from 73 to 86%. So no other topics that are really important actually left. Uh, another methodology that was developed specifically for this project, uh, we wanted to measure the attention time given for Ukraine, to discredit Ukraine, to talk about Ukraine in Kremlin government communications and Kremlin TV. So we scraped the articles, we scraped the TV, we transcribed it, all the uh, speech on the TV to text. Then we created a model that helps to assess the watching and reading time. Then with the natural language processing, we extracted all the keywords Kremlin propagandists used to define Ukraine. It's a long list. Then we added Ukrainian officials, public figures, geographic locations, and combined these together so we could map out uh, the attention time and span in, in Kremlin's communication about this. And with that, we are getting attention time to Ukraine in minutes. And that allows us to measure over time how it's changing. So we can see that before the invasion, it's pretty stable. So we're analyzing two TV shows and it's pretty stable. Uh, and Ukraine is basically a prime topic for, for them. The red line is the government communications and how much uh, attention time is given to Ukraine. And we can see here as well that it's growing and um, the TV shows and uh, these TVs are being controlled directly by Kremlin. So they can allow themselves to prolong those TV shows. So right before the invasion, they make those TV shows one hour longer. And here we can directly see that attention time to Ukraine grows, even though these were already almost about Ukraine. Here we can also see the collapse in communications, uh, the 10th week. So 10 days uh, into the invasion, uh, their plan has been broken. They needed to remake. They took one week to remake it and they started their disinformation campaign on biolabs. Uh, we, could com we compared what are the top uh, words and, and keywords or descriptive uh, keywords to describe Ukraine in Kremlin's government communication and Kremlin's TV. As you can see here that uh, nationalistic Nazi, neo-Nazi, genocide, uh, intra-Ukrainian extremists, uh, radical, banderas and so on, that's what's being communicated on Kremlin official channels. And we can see that they mirror exactly well in the Kremlin TV. You can see the same words, the same descriptive keywords used on the communication, which shows how well they are being coordinated and how well they just recommunicate was being communicated by the government, Kremlin government. Also with the analysis, how this is changing over the five months before the invasion and one month into invasion. And here we can see that uh, there's very clear peak when the invasion starts, uh, the same keywords tend to just explode because this is the, the way how they explain the reasons why they needed to invade the Ukraine. And why this is useful? Uh, because this is and the attention time and these measurings, they are automated. So we can fit in more videos over long period of time and measure how it changes. And out of that, try to find what are the predictive factors from communications to actual events. Uh, what's other thing important? So this is the government communications. Let's check how it looks on media. And we can see that the reflection is exactly the same. The same keywords, the only new one that's being added that um, they communicate a lot of things that they say it's fake. It's fake uh, that they failed. It's fake on the Gommel. It's fake on Bucha and so on, that everything was just staged by Western intelligence or Ukrainian intelligence. Uh, but what's useful here that over time we can predict and we can see how it fits in from the government communications to Kremlin commun TV communications and one that later sits on the people heads. 
Uh, so these are the top 10 narratives that were used over six months period in Kremlin television as a prime ones. So it's interesting to see that the prime one was that Russia is responding to security situation, then never ending story that West is morally corrupt. So with that, it's an overarching narrative that they're using last 20 years and they were always talking how the West is bad, how the West is now even Satan uh, and uh, how terrible it is and so on. But still, they want to go for vacation and send their kids to study in the West. Uh, Ukraine's leadership is illegitimate and discredited. Uh, then there is nationalistic uh, rhetoric. Russia is a strong and self-sufficient country. Uh, this is interesting. Ukraine's side is committing war crimes. This only started when the invasion started. They did not use this narrative before. Uh, what's very interesting to compare is how Kremlin communications looked before the invasion and after the invasion, and how it reflected with government communications and Kremlin television of these top two uh, channels and top two TV shows. So you can see that Ukraine fails to follow international agreements. NATO poses a threat. Ukraine is a failed state. Ukraine leadership is legitimate. Ukraine is a Western proxy. So these were the top ones. And you can see they really, really well to correspond to what's happening on the Kremlin TV and shows their tight grip together. Even though when you would analyze word by word, it would be different. But we, when we analyze this at the narratives level, it corresponds really well. So the Kremlin propagandists, they are working for the presidential office and they are communicating what they are being set to be communicated. So in this case, pre-invasion, eight out of 10 top narratives correspond really well, uh, actually the same if we would took even longer uh, list of the narratives that have that can be analyzed, the overlap is even bigger. When the invasion starts, uh, they start to communicate the top narrative in the government that Russia is responding to security situation. And this is their prime message that they are trying to communicate to the uh, in, inside audiences. And Russia holds high mor moral standards. So this is interesting. Uh, this narrative is uh, primarily used by the Kremlin MOD. It's not by MFA. So primary communicator before was uh, MFA and then MOD takes over. Uh, how many minutes? couple minutes okay mm -hmm. good uh, so uh, by doing this analysis we took these uh, uh, strategic narratives as a perspective from uh, Swedish Swedish civil contingencies agency uh, who developed those strategic narratives means that they have a plan and a very specific target and the techniques that they were using were uh, constructive which means this is the true so uh, they deny something happening and this is actually what they are saying this is the true then uh, something is happening and they create this disruptive narrative by saying that this is a lie and uh, then tr presenting what, what they want to present. Or it's a distractive, it's basically just look over there, uh, biolabs and so on. So why this is important, uh, pre-war, half of the government communications during five months were distractive. So it was always about look over there, look how the West is bad, look how... Uh, uh, other uh, Ukraine is failing, uh, government is legitimate, they are Nazis and so on. So it's always a distractive mag messages. And when the invasion starts, this changes. Uh, then this is being reduced and the other narratives are being used more. I will skip a few slides. Uh, so this is important. Uh, this is kind of a conclusion. So we can see that uh, Kremlin has a very tight grip on the media in the country. Uh, Presidential office, special services, FSB, GRU, SVR, administrative structures, NGO, think tanks, uh, fake experts, puppet experts, they are really well interconnected. Some of those speakers are being paid to talk nonsense on these TV shows. Uh, and we know that um, from testimonials and other examples that they have this thing, what they call Temnik, which is agenda. This is how they are giving the narratives, what to communicate further. And the evidence on the previous slide shows how it's tightly connected and coordinated. So state-influenced uh, media are communicating what's being on the Temnik. Uh, it's a, even a long term. So over the last 20 years, you can clearly see that it's always the same. And this is being communicated. Uh, in the state media, uh, the propagandists are competing. There is quite many of them, around 20, who compete with each other. And with coming in the picture with social media, we can clearly see that those propagandists who have uh, basically the biggest uh, uh, channels on the social media, they're still influenced directly by the Kremlin government. 
Uh, but the new ones, uh, war correspondents, other uh, content makers in Russia, they are just building new content, but they're still trying to be in line with the Kremlin communications because they want to earn their spot in this regime. They want uh, more attention, they want more money, and they want to be useful. And sometimes they invent better stories than Kremlin official propagandists and even the Kremlin government. And the last thing, just to... This is a really good uh, an example of uh, how Kremlin is doing at industrial scale propaganda and disinformation. So we analyzed uh, five biggest media outlets in Russia that have uh, 27 authors that look suspicious to us. And we started to investigate and we think at least four of those are definitely fake. Uh, and why do we think so? So, for example, uh, Marina Sovina is uh, an author in Lentaru. She was able to write 30, 38,000 articles in 12 months. <laughs> Extremely productive, even though super productive during the nights. So she only works from 9 in the evening till 9 in the morning. No other time. Then when we check the dates, so she clearly sometimes takes vacation as a robot. You see something, electricity <laughs> disappeared or something. So um, why we are a bit joking about this, that uh, we, it's either a lot of people working behind this name or it's either automation. And automation is more uh, realistic uh, feature here. And how uh, their pictures are being used, so they are generating uh, gun-generated gun images with a f to create fake personas. Even this example, uh, I like it even more. So this is another author, also writing like 42 articles per day. And um, uh, when you, so they all have bios, they all have contact details and so on, but they are fake. And you can see that uh, this photo is definitely fake. They, uh, she has different earrings, even the necklace is different on the other sides. So, you know, when you look in the details, you see this, uh, and I will stop here. Thank you. So, we have uh, online Neville, Dr. Neville Balk, can we join? Neville, floor is your. Uh, Good, uh, good evening from Tokyo. Um, Ramundus, I think it's uh, probably better if uh, Vera goes next because she's going to give you a whole um, presentation on empirical data and detail. And then I'll pick up a couple of general points straight after that. Vera? Yes, hi. Um, I hope uh, <clears throat> the audience can hear and see me. Yes, I can see the, I can see the audience. So I think um, um, our report, um, our report uh, from uh, from King Center for Strategic Communications, um, and um, together with uh, with extract, I'll say a few words about that. I think that the the, the kind of um, data that I'm about to present is probably the cautionary note that um, that was mentioned at the start. That yes, there is a strong sense in the West that Russia is is losing in this uh, so-called information war. That it that it that Russia itself um, um, declared against the West. Um, um, but what we are, what what we were, what we were studying, what we were describing, was maybe how Russia was um, was successful at some point, and successful specifically in uh, building a new ecosystem for um, from for its audiences, which is the Telegram, a, a, a social media platform which originated from Russia. And we saw how during the war, and what we show in our report and what we show in our research is how during the war, Russia really, uh, the Russian, Russian actors built up this uh, social media platform as a functioning ecosystem um, for, um, for this confrontation in information space. So what we did was that we teamed up with the Extract, which is a, a company that has a, an, an artificial intelligence powered data processing analytic systems. And actually what we, what, what we had was a kind of a hunch. We 
had the sense that Telegram had this potential. And so Extract with its AI tool started to track um, a Russian, the Russian speaking ecosystem that is focused on Ukraine um, from even from before the war. And what we saw there when, when Extract started working and started um, um, building up uh, um, this um, its data uh, from um, gathering data from Telegram was that not much was happening actually. It was pretty boring. Um, and there wasn't much there for us to work with. And this is the lead up to the war, right? This is the months before the, the weeks, the months before the war. What happened, um, the interesting thing that happened was that on the 17th of February, so think about it, four days before Putin makes his uh, announcement that he is um, <clears throat> that he is about, that the Russia, the Russian troops are about to engage in peacekeeping operation in Donetsk and Luhansk. So four days before this announcement, suddenly there is a, a tenfold spike, a, first an eightfold spike and then a tenfold spike in, um, uh, in uh, communications that is being shared on these pro-Russian channels, on these channels, uh, Russian speaking channels on, on Telegram that we identified um, <clears throat> in advance. And so Dr. Charlie Winter, who also wrote a piece in this report, gives me a phone call and says, whoa, this is all happening. We're seeing this enormous spike. And if you uh, take yourself back at the uh, uh, down uh, memory lane to these very uh, uh, stressful and unpleasant days, these were also the days when there was a tenfold increase in Russian ceasefire violations. So we're seeing increase in ceasefire violations from that date and from really following uh, the same timeline, we're seeing this enormous increase in communications on Telegram on these channels. And what we're starting to do is we're starting to gather this um, into a data set, into a large data set on the platform. Um, and it seemed to us from a very start that, that it looks like someone, someone is putting an effort into making Telegram this ecosystem, yes, into making um, Telegram into this important platform where information about what is about to happen, which they know that is about to happen because they're about to invade, how this will be communicated. And I think this was, and I'm putting a question mark here because we don't have definite answer to that, but we have a sense that um, although the Russians were not communicating effectively with the West, with Western audiences, or even with audiences outside of Russia, for Russian speaking audiences and domestic audiences, Telegram did was groomed into uh, this platform. And so what we had was this uh, 2.9 million posts that we collected from uh, um, 472 pro-Russia war group channels on Telegram, and it became an opportunity for us to research, to see whether this new platform, which emerged during the war, whether it uh, acts in ways that are similar to what we've seen from the Bank EU on how the Russian television broadcasts, Russian federal television, which has been uh, well researched and it was established that it's a tool in Russia's information war, whether they are acting in the same way. So we took the Bank to use uh, identified narratives. And what we did in the qualitative research is that we, um, we um, analyze the content from 10 leading accounts. We created a sample of diverse uh, channels on Telegram, and we saw how are they treating certain points in the war, certain points that create certain points in terms of the uh, development of the Russian invasion that created both, um, say, challenges and opportunities for uh, these channels. Um, and we actually, we said that, you know, actually at this point, we are, we are calling them the new commissars. They're the new, the, the Telegram admins became the new commissars because it's not only that uh, the Russian, uh, the, the, the Russian Telegram was energized from the admin side, yes, from how much communication was put out, but also in terms of the audiences, Russian or the Russian speaking audiences clearly migrated from Russian federal television onto Telegram. And we have, uh, we have numbers uh, of a large increase in Telegram's daily audiences from 25 million in January 2022 to 41 million people in July 2023. So we're seeing a large increase in terms of where the audiences are going. And so we have this new, this new commissars, so quote unquote, uh, that are emerging and they are, um, and they are um, communicating and explaining this war. And I think that what we found in the qualitative research is that we actually found that these these admins they because they behave because they have to behave as if they are in a network society yes because they have to behave on a user generated platform they have to be far more responsive they can't just 
be quiet. They can't just shut up and they can't also not respond to other things that are being shared on the platform. So what we saw was actually quite high levels of flexibility throughout the events that we surveyed. A very good example um, for this flexibility, um, we, we saw during the um, uh, days after the atrocities in uh, the town of Bucha were discovered. So there, there was it was very clear that the Russian government did not put out a certain line for these um, for these admins to work with. And they were but by that point they realized because the, the invasion was obviously not going as planned. So there were they had many such gaps and they understood that they have to step up and be flexible and create um and create their own uh, their own interpretation of events but i think that around the, the around the uh, discovery of atrocities in bucha there were it was a particularly interesting case on um on telegram and just kind of to 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 show how uh, the admins work you can see it in our report but first they say as the as the information emerges they say well this is ukrainian artillery but when we see photos from Bucha and it's obvious that it's not Ukrainian artillery who did it, they're saying it's all staged and very quickly you see that they're amplifying across channels that it's all staged. And then there is kind of a catharsic moment when um, um, when Sasha Kotz, Alexander Kotz, uh, uh, who is a prominent Russian war journalist, comes in and says, and he very importantly, Sasha Kotz was embedded with the Russian forces in northern in the in the Kiev region. So he knew he may have had some information that was unavailable to other admins. And he comes with this uh, version of events where the Ukrainian forces entered the town of Bucha and they they made they actually executed the people, they killed the people, the atrocities were made by them and he makes certain um he he uh, describes events in events in ways that are similar to what was later found but he pins it on, on the ukrainian armed forces and what is even more interesting is that a day later russia the russian ambassador to the un presents this version of events as the russian official line so sasha Kotz um created a narrative yes that help the Russian of help Russian officials to explain what was happening in Bucha. So this we see here a level of even entrepreneurship uh, on the behalf of these uh, of these admins. Now this is not to say that this that these admins, these new commissars are free to roam the information, uh, the information terrain and that this is a, a, a more liberal setting because many of these admins actually have connection to the Kremlin. They um well it's people like Sasha Kotz obviously are um, groomed by the Kremlin for their position. Others like uh, Vladimir Solovyov, they're also broadcasters. So obviously the relationship with the Kremlin is there. But what is interesting in how they behave on Telegram, and it is a cautionary note because they gain this know-how, how to behave on, uh, on in social media and how to create an ecosystem on social media. And the point there is that they are they are behaving as what we, what we call in network society switchers. So they take the power that is given to them by the Kremlin and they switch it onto the network work and then they switch it back to the and then they give power back to the crowning so this is an interesting uh, and flexible way in uh, which we behave i think that this is also a cautionary note that when we say well you know russia is, is losing uh, the information war but then and we're seeing how the Russian domestic audiences are responding to the war, and we're saying, well, they're all brainwashed propaganda, but many of them migrated to Telegram, and there they are getting much more flexible um, flexible messages, and maybe this is a new kind of uh, a new tool, a new know-how, or at least a new platform for the Russians to uh, operate in a more uh, flexible uh, manner. Thank you. Neville. Your floor in a couple minutes, please. We are limited of time, so summarize all these findings. In two minutes. Wonderful. Uh, I don't think we can do that. I don't think we can summarize all the findings, but let me give you a thought, a more contextual and general thought, which I think we're seeing uh, happening before us. Uh, first, I'll just remind you that the closer we move towards a, um, a conflict theater, the more complex and the more nonlinear uh, become the information flows. Um, 
But I think what we're actually seeing is generally uh, rival models of communications between Russia and Ukraine. And the first, uh, the Russian is st still an autocratic top-down command and control system, which is familiar to 20th century communicators, but adapting with an internal trial and error uh, of storylines which are being market tested. Some gain traction, others fail at birth, some disappear only to re-emerge at a later date. Um, what's noteworthy uh, is this arrival of semi-autonomous groups on platforms like Telegram, who attempt to dictate the rhythm and the content to advance pro-Moscow sympathies and storylines. But how far this resembles what militaries call mission command requires further research. Um, Russia's finding that the relationship between kinetic setbacks is leading to mission creep and a dislocating message creep that battlefield failure inevitably generates. While in Ukraine, we're seeing a kind of creative tension between a population that's networked via mobile telephony and the internet, and that seeks to originate messaging for itself, and where civil society is frequently running ahead of the central state's communicators. So is there here a greater trust between wartime leaders and the people? So what else can we learn from that? Well, the best way to understand communications processes here is as an ecosystem with subsystems. In both cases, the center doesn't exert complete control. The question is to what extent the population is trusted with free expression or constrained in disseminating information. I'm gonna stop there because we're short of time. Ramundas? We out of time. <laughs> thank you, Neville. Thank you, Vera, and thank you, Victoras. So for the questions to Victoras, I think during the break. Yes, so. I think we do have time for maybe one or two questions for for Victoras or actually all of the speakers. Anyone? No one? Anyone? Um, yes, sir, in the front. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I actually have a couple of questions, but they're related. Um, first, uh, can you give us the um, role and influence of the Russian Orthodox Church in this process? And can you also give us maybe one or two strategic examples of where there has been a success oh. rather than a failure after the war started? Who would like to take a stab at this question? Neville, Orthodox Church? I think, uh, Vera, have you done work on Orthodox Church? I mean, I haven't in Ukraine, only in Georgia. Um, Vera? I can give a quick comment before. Right. If, uh, so <clears throat> this was not part of this study. Uh, we are analyzing how Kremlin is using Orthodox Church uh, for the influence operations. And it's clear that last decade, uh, Kremlin is doing that systematically. Uh, by using these um, uh, Christian values, uh, by using this conservative thinking, um, anti-LGBT uh, sentiments, and so on. And this is being pushed pretty heavily. Uh, it had a lot of uh, uh, connections also with COVID. Uh, our latest analysis in the Balkans shows that um, uh, we discovered 1,336 groups and pages who systematically spread this information in the Balkans, having 60 million followers there in all the Western Balkan, in Balkan languages. And one third of those are religious groups connected either directly with the churches or heads of the churches or any other priests or employees who are there. And these groups are systematically used to spread disinformational content. And it's always anti-NATO, anti-EU, uh, anti-LGBT, uh, anti-West, anti-US, and, and so on. So they are clearly used as a channel uh, there from other studies, but not from this one. 
Okay, uh, maybe one more question, anyone? Okay, I guess if not, uh, thank you once again to all the speakers.